In this unit, we're going to look at pesticides, their application use, and also natural pesticides as well. Please refer to your list of learning targets for this unit on pesticides. The first thing we need to ask are what are pests exactly? We use that name frequently, but what do we actually mean? These are anything that interferes with our human welfare. A lot of times these are not really considered pests in nature, but because we don't like them as humans, they are aggravating to us and we call them pests. Some of the many things they might do is they might compete with us for food, they invade our lawns and gardens, spread disease, they're kind of a nuisance, and sometimes maybe actually invading ecosystems as a, as a, can be considered a pest as well. When it comes to pests, a lot of times there are actually natural enemies of things that we consider pests. Things might be have natural predators, there might be parasites or some sort of disease that helps control a population of a particular pest. And that's considered the, remember from our first, very first unit, the natural capital in the ecosystem. A great example of that are spiders. And in the world, there are over 30,000 different species of spiders. They actually kill more insects than all chemical pesticides that we apply across the globe. So spiders are uh, something that most people consider kind of yucky, but uh, actually they, without them, we would have be invaded by lots of and lots of other insects. One thing to keep in mind as we think about pesticides is there already exists before man a balance of nature. But what we have done is disrupted that by clearing forests, planting monocultures, and using chemicals that upset those natural population checks and balances them. We then need to devise a new way to protect, protect our new nature. And what I'm thinking about in terms of new nature is our new nature is when we produce a monoculture crop. A monoculture crop can really just be that front lawn you have or the, the yard you have where you don't want a single dandelion in there. You don't want any clover. It needs to be just one big sea of green uniform grass. That is actually a monoculture. Or we might have tree plantations, golf courses with one type of grass in one area and one in another. We want that to be the way we want it to look when that's not really the way that nature intended. So how do we get rid of these pests? We use what are pesticides. And pesticides are any chemicals that are used to kill or control populations or organisms that we decide are undesirable. And it's really humans deciding that these things are undesirable. And these can break into many different categories. The overall umbrella term are just pesticides, but then you can separate those into insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and rodenticides. Um, killing rodenticides, killing rats and mice, fungicides, killing fungus, herbicides for weeds, and insecticides for insects. We do have a long history of use of, of pesticides. Um, we consider one, one category called just first-generation pesticides, and these are things that we have known about for a long time. Just any natural chemical that, that copies nature. Um, some farmers have known about these for years, that uh, you plant a row of marigolds next to your tomato plants in your garden because marigolds give off a scent that some pests don't like. Um, nicotine and onion varieties are used in some natural areas because they give off scents that certain varieties of insects don't don't like. You can use other other insects like Japanese beetles to eat other beetles or other insects. You can apply lime in situations. Lime is a calcium oxide. It's not the green lime that you that you eat. Um, but uh, those are some natural products that we can use. These things work because of evolution that. They've been around together working in nature for a really long time with other, um, other organisms. And thanks to natural selection and coevolution, they've developed into a working relationship. Our second generation pesticides began in 1939 when entomologist Paul Mueller uh, developed DDT. Uh, since that time, there have been hundreds of other pesticides that have been made by making modifications to other chemicals. One of the uh, things we've talked about since early in the school year about the use of pesticides is the overuse of these second generation pesticides. Uh, these were again developed in the 1940s and, and 50s and then in early 1960s um, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring alerting the public to the effects of pesticides. She really focused on 
the threat of uncontrolled use of pesticides. Many people kind of vilify her for uh, saying that she didn't know what she was talking about, that uh, she's trying to increase the rate of malaria in the world, um, all sorts of crazy things. Um, but um, she really did kind of bring the scientific community and the pesticide industry back to a more reasonable use of, of pesticides. One thing that's interesting about the use of these second generation pesticides is that our increase has uh, our use has increased by more than 50 fold since 1950. Quite an alarming statistic from that is we're increasing our use, but today's pesticides are actually up to 100 times more toxic than those used in the 50s. So we have a lot of pesticides now, and they're also much more powerful than, than their predecessors. We're going to next look at some different types of these second generation pesticides. And one thing that happened uh, really since the 1970s and kind of making definitely a resurgence today with the organic movement is the use of biopesticides. These weren't really uh, come about till the 1970s, and this is kind of going back to the earlier first generation types of pesticides in which we tried to develop pesticides that, that mimic nature. Um, so these might be uh, things that have oils from spices, things like that. Um, and these would be able to be used by organic farmers. And since they are natural products, they can still consider that food to be organically grown. A change from that are something called broad spectrum pesticides. Uh, these are ones that are harmful to many, many pests, but they could also harm beneficial pests as, as well. Um, these are typically into two different categories. One are called chlorinated hydrocarbons. You should know that, that name and know an example of that would be the chemical compound DDT. Um, another group are called organophosphates, and these are ones that have an organic part to it, so that's a carbon-hydrogen bonds to it, and then a phosphate molecule attached to that, or phosphate ion. Um, and these would include some, some brand names called Malthion and Parathion. Um, one, another one that you might know from your home use that you might have is, is a chemical compound known as Roundup. It's been we've talked about that in a couple of videos. Roundup essentially kills all plants. It's not selective whatsoever, so it's very broad. Um, and you might notice this too if you have maybe like an insect killer. You might have one that just says general insect killer and it lists a whole bunch of various insects that it kills, whether they be ants, flies, uh, whatever. Um, whereas you might have a separate chemical that is considered a selective um, or a narrow uh, spectrum where it kills only one particular thing, like this is just good on wasps or something like that. One of the compounds that is, is usually pretty selective is a compound like decon, where it kills mice, and that's all it kills. Um, you do have to be cautious of these because sometimes uh, children get into this. You really wouldn't want that to occur if other pets, uh, things like that, get into uh, this. You really won't want them to ingest any decon as well. So these are usually very selective. They're either specifically for rodents or maybe something that's specific for algae or mites. Or uh, there's one called molluscicides, which that's for like snails and uh, that type of organism. Always one of the concerns with uh, pesticide use is persistence, and this is the length of time that a pesticide stays in the environment. DDT and any of the other um, chlorine-containing um, pesticides remain in the ecosystem for years and years and can biomagnify so that each level of the, um, the, the food chain has an increased amount of that chemical in their system and uh, all the way up to the tertiary consumers. The organophosphates are slightly less persistent than that, but at the same time they can be highly toxic to humans, so that is also still a concern. When we think about persistence, we also have to remember our use of pesticides and one of the things that's kind of an alarming statistic is that the average lawn has more pesticides on it, 10 times more than what an eagle area of land that's used for cropland does. Homeowners are probably the least educated when it comes to pesticide use and typically use them freely 
without really thinking about the effects that they might have or knowing the right uh, amount that should be spread on, um, mixing that properly, um, making sure that it's applied at the appropriate time, whether some have to be applied when the grass is wet, some need to be applied when the grass is dry, what's the wind when they apply that. So this is really a, a concern that homeowners need to be more educated about the use of pesticides. One reason that uh, our pesticide use is so prevalent, I just went quickly to the Home Depot website and there were 669 products listed under the Home Depot website as pesticides. You go into any home improvement or hardware store and you'll see a complete aisle just filled with every type of pesticide imaginable, whether they be broad spectrum, narrow spectrum, whether they're for a spray, a granule type powder, uh, just literally hundreds of products out there and is the consumer actually educated enough to know how to use those properly.